Given the number of war films out there, it's a wonder that this conflict has never made it onto the silver screen. Filled with heroism and horror, the suspenseful battle that raged at Pea Ridge was a pivotal moment in the American Civil War. As the two factions clashed over the control of the strategic border state of Missouri, one army would prove victorious and the other would disintegrate almost entirely. When the Civil War broke out in America, the North and the South split. However, this split was not a neat divide, and many border states suffered from internal conflict. Some slave states, such as Missouri, did not split from the Union. The Confederacy was determined to take the state, seeing it as their gateway to the West. They planned to advance through Missouri, defeat the Union forces, and take St. Louis, which was infamously pro-Union and a major commercial and industrial center. Missouri stood between the Union and the northwest flank of the Confederate states, making it a key border state. Another strategically important area was the Mississippi River, which linked the Confederacy's east and west. The Confederacy went into the winter of 1861 with high hopes, but by the start of spring of 1862, they had been pushed back to the Missouri-Arkansas border. Confederate President Jefferson Davis needed to regain Missouri to rekindle hope for victory. To lead the campaign, he chose a man who had proven himself by keeping control of Texas when the war first broke out. A man from Jefferson's home state of Missouri who had stood aside when Jefferson asserted that he wanted to be in command of Confederate troops there. Confederate Major General Earl Van Dorn was an experienced and war-hardened soldier who understood the importance of taking St. Louis and regaining control of Missouri. He also longed for military prestige and power and confidently anticipated the many accolades that would come his way when he won the state. In Fayetteville, Arkansas, Van Dorn assembled his army of around 16,500 Confederate soldiers, including 8,000 Texans, 7,000 Missourians, and, perhaps surprisingly, 2,000 Native Americans, mostly from the Cherokee. The Civil War not only divided the newly forming United States, but also caused separation in the Native population since a handful of Cherokee owned and operated large plantations on their lands, benefiting from an enslaved workforce. While most Cherokees sided with the Confederacy, those who sided with the Union ultimately decided to cooperate with the Confederates when Brigadier General Albert Pike negotiated treaties that stipulated the Native American soldiers were not required to leave their territory. However, this agreement would soon be tested. Van Dorn planned to retake Missouri by moving west and outflanking the Union forces. He would then cut off their supply lines and attack them from behind. Afterward, he planned to capture St. Louis and move east to meet General Albert Sidney Johnson. Together, they would attack the Union forces in Tennessee, forces under the command of Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant. The Confederate troops outnumbered the Union soldiers stationed in Missouri under General Samuel Curtis, who had more experience as a politician than a soldier. Van Dorn wasted no time mobilizing his troops, and they began their journey on March 4, 1862. The movement had an inauspicious start as heavy snow began to fall and Van Dorn, recovering from an illness, fell into a fever and spent the initial part of the march lying in a wagon. Traversing the rugged Boston Mountains added more strain to the already difficult journey. Trudging through snowdrifts against blistering winds undoubtedly made their progress slower than they might have wished. Meanwhile, the Union had learned of Van Dorn's approach, and Curtis moved his troops to meet the advancing army. Unbeknownst to Van Dorn, Curtis was quite the strategist. Thirty miles northeast of Fayetteville, a long hill called Pea Ridge lay where Curtis gathered his forces. They entrenched themselves along Little Sugar Creek, which ran parallel to the ridge and gave the Union troops a natural defensive barrier complemented by the mountains to the west. Curtis centered his operations at Elkhorn Tavern, and his right flank, which Van Dorn had expected to turn, rested by Elkhorn Mountain and Pea Ridge. On March 6th, Van Dorn and his army approached Curtis's camp and realized he had little chance of slipping by them unnoticed. He decided to try and deal with these forces before advancing any further north. Van Dorn planned to utilize the mountains the Union was using as a defense to hide the Confederates' movements. After a minor success against a small Union detachment, Van Dorn intended to sneak up on Curtis's troops from the rear, meaning that Little Sugar Creek would no longer be a defensive advantage. Eager to enact his plan, he moved his weary troops forward on the night of March 6th, shielded from view by the mountains, on the Bentonville Detour Road. 
he planned to use two other divisions under Major General Sterling Price and Brigadier General Benjamin McCullough in a pincer movement and surprise the Union soldiers in a rear attack. Van Dorn was confident he would secure his victory. To add to the subterfuge, he kept the Confederate campfires burning in front of the Union position to distract from his actual maneuvers. As day broke on the morning of March 7th, Curtis noticed the lack of movement in the Confederate camp and realized they had gone. He had to discover where they went. After sunrise, scouts informed him that they were making their way towards them from behind and were moving in large numbers along Pea Ridge. Curtis had a tough choice to make. Should he use this early warning to make his escape? They could easily retreat across Little Sugar Creek and flee to Arkansas or circle back to Missouri. Instead, Curtis chose to turn his army around and face the oncoming threat in battle. While a 180-degree turn may have disorientated the troops, the rested and disciplined men maintained their order and prepared themselves for the fight to come. The Confederates were tired and cold from their long trek through the dark mountain roads during the night and were hours behind schedule, but they had the advantage of numbers. At 10.30 a.m., the first skirmish of the Battle of Pea Ridge broke out. The Missourians, led by Price, advanced on Elkhorn Tavern, where the Union Colonel Eugene Carr was waiting for them. Carr's men were outnumbered, and despite their preparedness, the Confederate forces had broken the line of defense by noon. Two and a half miles away from Elkhorn Tavern, McCullough and his Texan division met Union troops at Leetown. The Union men were under the command of Colonels Jefferson C. Davis and Peter Osterhaus. Like Carr's flank, the Federals were outnumbered and suffered a brutal onslaught. The Confederates had superior artillery and infantry on both wings, giving them the upper hand. Joining McCullough was Brigadier General Albert Pike, commanding the Native American troops. The Native Americans quickly overran the Union forces under Osterhaus and began to chant victory songs. As night approached, Curtis was in a dire position, and both wings at Leetown and Elkhorn Tavern were requesting reinforcements. Osterhaus had lost ground, artillery, and equipment, but the fight was not over yet. Thick clouds of gun smoke and dust hung heavy in the waning daylight, and both sides began to assess their position. While it seemed Van Dorn had the upper hand, his haste to act had created the same disadvantages for his own men that he hoped to inflict on his enemy. In order to move quickly and disrupt the supplies of his enemy, he left the slow and unwieldy ammunition train behind, which essentially severed his own supply line. After the heavy initial assaults, the Confederates were running low on ammunition, but their supplies now lay behind enemy lines. They'd also cut off their own means of retreat. By dusk on March 7th, the Confederate forces were exhausted. They had made a grueling trek through adverse weather conditions, only to spend all night marching through the mountains, hoping to catch the Union forces off guard. But the Federal troops were not surprised by a rear attack and instead had mounted a defense head on. Then, the Native American troops refused to rejoin the battle after their initial success against Osterhaus. Soon, they withdrew from the fray completely. The Confederates suffered another blow when General McCullough was shot dead just before mounting his ultimate attack. McCullough was such a legendary figure to his men that many were completely demoralized, stopping mid-charge and abandoning their position. Only Albert Pike evaded death and capture to lead his remaining men to the north side of Pea Ridge in order to rejoin Price's wing. After an initial onslaught, the Union soldiers had been able to keep Price's forces at bay. Despite the rapidly decreasing supply of ammunition, Van Dorn had continued to order his exhausted troops to mount an assault. Seeing that the danger to his left flank had waned, Curtis sent his reserves to Carr's aid. The fatigued and depleted Confederate men sought shelter and sleep not wanting to fight into the night. During the night, Curtis realized that any superiority the Confederates had in numbers had been weakened, and those men still fighting were incapacitated with exhaustion. More Union men strengthened his right flank under cover of darkness. Now it was the Confederates who were on the defensive. Dawn's light illuminated a very different scene from what Van Dorn had anticipated. His forces were low on food, ammunition, and motivation as the Union soldiers enjoyed a cooked breakfast and the elation that they had successfully withstood an attack from a larger army. Van Dorn ordered the artillery to start firing as soon as the sun rose, but Curtis could tell that their steam and ammunition had almost run out. 
The Union gunners began to knock out the Confederate cannons as their infantry pushed forward and beat the Confederates back from the ridge. Before long, the Union soldiers had regained the land they lost the day before, and victory swiftly followed. Van Dorn and the remainder of his men scattered, beating a hasty retreat. Utterly demoralized by the attack, Van Dorn took his army to the east bank of the Mississippi. This hasty retreat left Arkansas undefended by Confederate forces. The Battle of Pea Ridge was the largest battle west of the Mississippi during the American Civil War and played a pivotal role in the outcome. The Union victory secured Missouri for the Federals and was a turning point in their efforts to dominate the Trans-Mississippi. It also allowed for a Union occupation of Arkansas. In contrast, Missouri was lost to the Confederate States, closing their gateway to the West. The loss of one of the largest offensive battles fought by the Confederates signaled one of their largest defeats. From here on out, the Confederates would be forced to fight a defensive war in the West. The loss of McCullough and many other good soldiers was a major blow for the Confederates, compounded by the realization that they'd also lost any hope of reaching St. Louis. The Battle of Pea Ridge was the first major battle in the American Civil War to include Native Americans, resulting in controversy. The Native Americans were reluctant to march into Arkansas, as their treaty had stated they would stay in their territory. But when back pay was offered, they agreed to go. After their initial victory, the men captured Union guns and reportedly celebrated in a disorderly and frenzied manner. Pike could not regain control over them, and it was later discovered that some of the Union soldiers had been scalped. This act was used in Union propaganda, and the story soon grew beyond reality. In truth, no one ever discovered who perpetrated the scalping, but the Cherokee were blamed, resulting in 11 Cherokee prisoners being shot while in Union custody. A few months after the battle, Pike resigned his commission and was later indicted for inciting atrocities during the war. Today, Pea Ridge National Military Park is one of the best-preserved Civil War battlefields in the country, and Elkhorn Tavern has been reconstructed on the foundation of the original building. The park offers guided tours of the battlefield, preserving the memory of this pivotal conflict. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about the Battle of Pea Ridge, check out our book, The Battle of Pea Ridge, a captivating guide to the Battle of Elkhorn Tavern which was an American Civil War clash in Arkansas that took place in March of 1862. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.